vulnerable is that, uh, actually? Well, we have to realize in the first place that interference with shipping on the high seas uh, is a war, a warlike act, uh, and therefore we um, need to uh, envisage that sort of situation and need not be concerned, as it were, with anything um, less. An undercover offensive uh, comparable to the one which um, sank some ships on the way to Republican Spain during the Spanish Civil War. They were later, the attacking ships were later found to be um, Italian, as um, nobody doubted for a moment, uh, is uh, not likely to take place. Uh, but the um, coastline the route has to pass by is extremely long. And uh, if some of these littoral states have designs on the traffic, uh, well, uh, that uh, would be a serious matter. But only South Africa possesses a navy of significant size. And uh, whether or not South Africa would be included in or associated with the uh, Western defense of this route, it's at any rate inconceivable that South Africa would seek to interrupt it. Nigeria has a small number of heavily armed patrol craft, and uh, these may be acquired by other uh, countries, uh, but um, it's only the Soviet Navy that could or would be likely to offer any significant threat to the oil traffic. So what can one say about that? Uh, well, first this, that operations mounted by the Soviet Navy from home bases uh, should have very little likelihood of success as long as they focus on the southern sector because the distance from the USSR is just too long. The times of transit of submarines or any other vessel is just uh, uh, excessively long, prohibitively so. Surface raiding, conceivable. It's uh, remembered in Britain that the first two naval service engagements of um, the first naval service engagements in both world wars took place in the southern hemisphere. But nowadays we have satellite and aerial reconnaissance which considerably reduces the likelihood of a ship remaining at large for a long time. Of course, we do assume here, here also that the West will keep some superiority over the Soviet Navy. And as I was talking about uh, earlier today, that uh, is becoming a more dubious matter. And if it uh, were lost, of course, the opportunities for their interception would greatly improve and our own likelihood uh, would be improved if we could operate from nearer bases to, uh, along the route, uh, and their likelihood of interception would be improved if they could do so. And here we have to notice a change that's disadvantageous to the West as compared with a decade ago. The West has lost, and as the USSR has gained, facilities in um, Aden and uh, in Angola and Mozambique, um, Russia has also gained some facilities in Iraq and, uh, and, uh, and in Guinea. And we have given them up uh, in South Africa. Now, these developments weaken the case for the defense and strengthen that for the uh, offensive. It's true their facilities, such as they are, can't be regarded as naval bases uh, in uh, any strict sense of that term. They're most likely simply halting points, um, anchorages, uh, in uh, the U.S., one would require at least interior lines of communication and um, extensive engineering facilities and control of the immediate neighborhood. Uh, they wouldn't be facilities for replenishment unless these are deposited in advance uh, or for uh, extensive repairs. The ships themselves, any crew reinforcements, ammunition, spare parts would have to come uh, by a tortuous sea route uh, or by air. Uh, so the support those facilities could offer to any Soviet forces. Uh, should be slight and precarious. It seems unlikely that the Russians would rely on such uncertain support in their ocean oceanic exercises, the last of which was five years ago, Okean 75. They uh, emphasized self-sufficiency and they uh, simulated air-to-surface strikes as far south as the Azores. On the other hand, uh, as I noted, we have uh, lost or more exactly given up facilities in South Africa. This was a decision of the British Labour government. And from a purely naval viewpoint, Simon's Town uh, by Cape Town is the ideal place uh, to protect routes passing around the Cape. This doesn't mean to say that I would now advocate seeking to uh, regain them because, of course, the situation, uh, so far as South Africa is concerned, 
uh, is far more complicated and apart from the undesirability to most of us of their internal policies, this would bring us um, immediately into conflict with the majority in black Africa. So it is a more complicated problem and there's simply a naval base. There are a couple of developments in Soviet naval construction which might bear on the situation. But this summer they um, completed uh, a battle cruiser, the uh, Kiowoff. The last battle cruisers were built by Germany and the United States about uh, 40 years ago. So this is a rather unusual development. And uh, they're going to build a nuclear aircraft carrier, as it seems. Also, there have been reports of their building an extremely large submarine of unknown purpose. And now one builds big ships to go, uh, at big, uh, to go a big distance from the homeland and, and useless in uh, coastal waters. So they may be being in, there may be the intention of deploying them uh, to uh, a large distance. As regards the submarine, we don't know its purpose. One recalls that um, in World War II, during the most um, difficult period of its um, besieging, Malta was supplied by a submarine. In fact, uh, I saw the quantity the other day, and about 65,000 tons of supplies were got to Malta by a submarine, which is quite a lot. I don't know if that could be, um, uh, if the Soviets might have visited that, or if so, whether they have any thought of um, applying this uh, in the round the, key, round the Cape. Route. We need much more information to confirm that sort of speculation. If um, Russia did seek to interrupt the sea lanes of supply by naval means, the most vulnerable sector, from um, our point of view, is certainly near the point of origin. Two compensating disadvantages, perhaps. Um, uh, one, because of the time of transit, if you cut off supplies at that point, there's still about a month when tankers on, in uh, uh, en route will continue to arrive. So as a result of the Iraq-Iran war, uh, we didn't uh, have an immediate interruption of supplies. And then uh, there would be to contend with the slight um, in numbers navies of the Gulf states themselves. And uh, then, because this is the obvious place, this is also the place where we would concentrate our own force. And indeed, we've already done so. There's already a bigger concentration of Western naval forces in that area. And evidently, the West, uh, and especially the United States, is going to keep a bigger naval presence in the Indian Ocean from now onwards. Uh, let me pass on to the uh, further threat of um, a menace of excessive oil prices and the impact of national policies, for instance, relating to conservation. Oil prices have risen tenfold since 1973. And I suppose if anyone at that time had imagined such an increase, they probably would have predicted a far greater disruption in supplies than, in fact, occurred. Our economic system has a, a lot of flexibility and ability to exploit, uh, ability to absorb shocks. We've learned to live, if not very happily, with high oil prices. <coughs> no future rise can reproduce the stunning effect of the quadrupling of oil prices in 1973 to 4, simply because of preparatory measures and, I suppose, some sort of psychological um, uh, preparation in advance taken by the consuming countries. Certainly, so far as the United States is concerned, there remains, by comparison by, with Western Europe, a fairly wide scope for allowing the prices of petroleum products to find their own level, which undoubtedly would mean higher prices today. Of course, it's not to say that the import or impact of higher prices has not been extremely serious. Its impact on developing countries has been greatest at the present moment. Countries like Pakistan and Turkey, which incidentally are both Muslim countries, are spending on petroleum virtually all their foreign exchange earnings. The obvious way of escape uh, from uh, the present oil bind, as well as from any future price increase, would seem to be to use less oil, either through cutting consumption in general uh, of energy or by switching to alternative forms of energy, or, of course, by a mixture of both strategies. And these seem the more reasonable courses, given that the present extent of dependence of oil on oil is a fairly recent phenomenon. Before 1973, a switch to oil from other sources of power, for instance coal, was seen as uh, a progressive trend and took place to a large extent, especially uh, in this country. So couldn't one just turn back the clock 
and rely again primarily on other energy sources, uh, particularly coal. And several Western countries, including uh, the US uh, very prominently, also Britain. And uh, by the way, on the other side of the world, the People's Republic of China, have very large stocks of coal. Couldn't one exploit these to a greater extent? Well, this is being done, uh, will be to an increasing degree. According to a recent uh, evaluation, it would even be economical to build a coal-fired ship, taking us back about um, 60 years. Now, there are some special problems. In Britain, too great a reliance on coal would result in our being held up to ransom every few years by the miners' trade union. Uh, the objection is mainly, however, to the inconvenience of coal, its dirtiness, to the environmental damage it's liable to cause, is causing, for instance, at the moment in Czechoslovakia, Moravia. The um, environmental lobby became powerful only after coal had been abandoned as the chief power source. And secondly, the impracticability of using coal to power automobiles or aircraft. Now, clearly, automobile design has to change in a fundamental manner use other forms of, of power, and something's being done in this direction, more ought to be done. The communist countries, excluding Czechoslovakia, have lagged far behind the West in developing an automobile industry, or any network of accompanying highways and other facilities, so in a sense they're more advantageously placed uh, in this uh, matter of the making the fuel adaptable to usable um, consuming equipment. On the other uh, side, though, they have less opportunities for economizing. And the same applies even more strongly to developing countries, which also has to have to rely on the expertise of the more technically advanced countries to the extent that they put this to the service of the needs of the developing countries to discover means of using alternative power sources. Um, reversal of the trend from using more oil towards using less has demanded a correspondingly abrupt switch in research in this sphere. To some extent, the new course has come uh, to be uh, the prerogative of the so-called alternative technology and has consequently been caught up in a quest for a more labor-intensive, less capitally intensive forms of technology, which are so badly needed in the third world. Uh, it would seem that both high and low technologies have some part to play in alleviating the oil shortage. Uh, I would guess that the West will play a bigger role in this connection than the East because the communist countries have stuck one-sidedly to the view that only the more advanced types of technology should be adopted. But it can't be said that fully rational attitudes have been adopted in the West either. In some respects, the environmental lobby took up clearly exaggerated positions. I can't resist referring to Concord. It flies over my house in London about once a week. Be glad to see it to suggest it makes any significant contribution to the local pollution problem would be ridiculous. Up to now, it's um, been possible to mitigate the effects of oil shortages and higher prices, partly through economizing, partly through emphasizing uh, alternative sources of supply, though there's much to do in both directions. Predictably, Europe has done a little better than the United States in this direction. Um, Coming to um, you at the US, though I don't notice it now, uh, one used to be struck by the lavish use of energy in certain fields. Uh, traveling about um, America by night, of which I've done um, a good deal lately, uh, one sees uh, very rarely when one is out of, uh, 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 out of sight of um, lights in some directions, and whenever one comes to anything like a city, it's ablaze with light. I've also driven from Bristol to London, which is about 100 miles, to a relatively densely settled area, uh, and most of the time it's pitch black. Well, I find the US style more cheerful. <laughs> um, of course, given the evolution here of certain lifestyles, um, fundamental change is very dif difficult, uh, and indeed you've gone further in some directions than Europe, and notably the 55 mile an hour speed limit. The speed limit in Britain is 70 miles an hour, and in West Germany on the Autobahn, there's no limit. They think that um, enables them to discharge various kinds of inhibitions. <laughs> uh, and also some new developments like the Washington subway are um, useful from an environmental angle uh, and uh, should, at any rate, in the long run, save energy.
They do help me uh, also in getting around Washington without a car. The breadth and influence here of the environmentalist lobby is uh, noticeable, although it has not yet instigated the levels of violence uh, that have been seen in West Germany or Japan. But his influence, as far as it has been exerted in opposition to nuclear power, has not, uh, in my view, been altogether helpful. Nuclear power is the most readily available alternative source of power at the present time. We search into renewable sources such as the winds, um, waves, solar power, our, our tides, are at present at an earlier stage. Although, of course, wind power has been used for many centuries. Um, well, tide power is being harnessed already in the estuary of River Rasse in northwest France. Solar power is being used fairly extensively in Israel. Uh, my son uh, brought back some photographs of the hut in which he lived in, uh, which was being, uh, well, I suppose, cooled uh, in that case rather than heated by solar power. There are about 20,000 passive solar houses in the uh, United States at the present time, and there is uh, no doubt scope to extend this number. Heating, cooling, and lighting of buildings at present consumes nearly a quarter of the world's energy. Better insulation can cut down this proportion, although, of course, it will that will entail heavy capital cost. And nuclear power has been delayed not only by environmentalist groups uh, like the nuclear power no thanks stickers um, in languages uh, which I've recently seen as um, different from each other as Finnish and Welsh, uh, but by um, escalating costs and by not completely foreseen safety hazards. The environmental hazards can't be explained away. They are mainly of a hypothetical nature, with the exception of what appears to have been a severe disaster in the Urals, Chelyabinsk area of the USSR in 1957. There's been no damage remotely comparable to the tremendous environmental harm and loss of life resulting uh, over the years from coal mining. Finally, in regard to national policies, for the foreseeable future, it will be chiefly OPEC policies that concern us, and they're not likely to become less arrogant. Yet um, the last three meetings have failed to produce agreement. Saudi Arabia has um, increased production. Other member countries have raised their prices. Among NATO countries, Britain and Norway combine nationalization with foreign participation. Norway, at any rate, doesn't wish to deplete its reserves too soon. It's not yet clear what British policy will be. Uh, presumably, conservation will um, become a more uh, attractive option here, too. Although not members of OPEC, Britain, uh, by here, I mean uh, uh, there, I should say, in Britain, too. Um, though not members of OPEC, Britain and Norway have followed OPEC prices. Well, uh, it would take a remarkable policy of self-abnegation uh, to do otherwise. Nations on the whole are not noted for doing that. Canada is an important producer of oil, uh, though uh, in, in intending to become <coughs> uh, more Canadianized than it is at present. At the moment, it's 70% foreign owned. U.S. production is in the hands of large corporations, uh, which I won't find necessary to name, and um, some others. Prices have been subject to controls and federal policies of used taxation and environmental conservation. It seems likely that under the new president would be a trend towards market decision-making, in particular stress on expanding production. Finally, in the short run, should not obscure the, obscure the need to diversify or to e economize. Well, beginning to sum up this very complicated story, I've um, stressed both the variety of the problems facing Western petroleum suppliers and the difficulty of arriving at firm conclusions concerning which tasks are the most urgent. Securing our supplies is not simply a matter of conservation. Stepping up the rate of production will not solve the problem, although it by, may buy short-term relief. Uh, clearly, we need to step up the rate of exploration. Wholesale objection to alternative sources of power cannot prove helpful. It's necessary and probably possible to safeguard the sea lanes of communication. We also have to deter even more dangerous moves against the oil-producing regions. And so we need military and diplomatic strength, but they will not by themselves uh, be sufficient. Diversification of resources must help. Meanwhile, economizing is the order of the day. Thank you. We will now be willing to
Dr. Hutchins will be willing to field a couple questions. Yes, or chatting or comment uh, as you uh, will. Are there any questions? I guess not. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't know anything more than, uh, than you do in this connection. Um, one might say they are, as it were, overdue for making a big oil fine, but this doesn't mean that they uh, have made it. Uh, what they are getting, to, getting into uh, is an, an increasing problem of getting into more and more um, climatically extreme areas. Obviously, they've explored the most um, climatically accessible ones first. And when you get into Siberia, well, it depends on where you are, but um, you can have uh, winter temperatures going down to minus 50 centigrade, which is uh, pretty cold, and it makes a big difference to the uh, extraction techniques.